Good afternoon. Hopefully you've all been served. Uh, it's, a, it's great to see so, so many folks here today. I'm Rich Terrapak and I'm president of the CMC board and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the forum today. Um, in case you haven't done so, as Jane uh, pointed out earlier, uh, put your phone in whatever capacity you can that you can still tweet, but you don't he we don't hear anything about it. So uh, remember to do that because it can be sort of uh, annoying. Um, before we get started today, I want to talk about some of the things coming up in the very near future, as in tomorrow and the day after. Uh, it's a busy week for us. We have three events this week. Uh, tomorrow we have the Harrison Smith Legacy, Bill Smith Legacy Forum, uh, and we're featuring the nationally known artist Brian Toll, who is the guy you, you've seen some of the uh, preliminary sketches for some of the uh, public sculpture that, he's, that we're planning down, or they're planning down by the river front. Also, please make a reservation for the annual holiday party and the not-so-silent auction. Uh, it's called the Jingle Mingle. It'll be held at the Columbus Museum of Art from 5.30 to 8.30 on Thursday. Members, uh, it'll cost you 35 bucks, but you can bring along three friends. So if you want to entertain inexpensively, sign up. The, uh, you can find information on those forums and all our forums at, at our website, columbusmetroclub.org and in the program. Take a program with you, leave it someplace obvious in the office or on, on a uh, stand at the coffee shop or something like that so other folks can uh, see all the good things that we have going on. Um, we want to welcome guests as we always do and as Jane indicated, um, we'd love to have you on a, on a regular basis. You can sign up, there's an application at the registration table or you can go online uh, and when you do sign up, for the very small dues that we charge, you also get a free lunch the first time. I um, want to recognize our sponsors uh, for today and, and actually for the, for the year. The companies listed on the back of the program uh, are our program sponsors and what they do to, to, to help underwrite um, our activities is about 50% of our annual budget. Um, if there's someone else you'd like to see on the list, like your company or firm, uh, who is not on that list, please see our CMC staff and, and uh, Jane Scott or P. Susan at, at the front desk can help you. Today's sponsors, uh, we've got quite a group. Uh, the, uh, the forum is, is presented in partnership with Tech Columbus, represented by CEO Ted Ford and Tim Haynes and others from Tech Columbus. Uh, we're also grateful for the sponsors, the Columbus Partnership, represented by our regular guest CEO, Alex Fisher, and his associates. At, uh, also, Columbus 2020, represented by CEO Kenny McDonald and his associates, and Resource Interactive with Nancy Kramer and her associates. Let's give them all an applause. Thank you, one and all. Um, it really is a pleasure to present today's discussion featuring two leading experts in their field of venture capital and funding innovative startup companies. First up, we have a very special guest to lead the discussion. Prior to being a partner at Sequoia Capital for more than a decade, he was CEO of CKS Group, an advertising agency at, that helped launch Yahoo, Excite, eBay, and Amazon, not a bad list of clients. Um, and last January, the newly elected Governor John Kasich selected him to serve as President and CIO of Jobs Ohio. Let's welcome Mark Kwame. Mark, come on up. And our speaker also joined Sequoia in uh, 1986 after working as a reporter for Time Magazine. He also wrote a book in 1984 uh, called, or uh, entitled, The Little Kingdom, The Private Story of Apple Computer. His internet company investments include, listen to this list, Google, Yahoo, PayPal, Apple, Cisco, Webvan, YouTube, eToys, and many others. Forbes uh, magazine has recognized uh, some of, uh, of his accomplishments on the Midas list. Uh, in, I believe it was 19, uh, or excuse me, 2006 or 2007, he was the deal maker of the year in the technology industry. He's also earned a place in 2007 on the Time 100 list. He ranked number two on the Forbes Midas list for 2008 and 2009. Please welcome the managing partner, director, Sequoia Capital, Mike Morris.
and the little accent is he's a native of Wales. <laughs> well, uh, thanks very much uh, for having us here today. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to, uh, to sit up here and, and talk to Mike. I thought what, what we do is, uh, I'm going to do my best Charlie Rose, Rose impression, and you guys can all grade me at the end. But I actually I'd like to start with something, as many of these folks here know. I, uh, I got a degree in French, and it ended up in Silicon Valley, because that's where my parents were. You got a degree in uh, history from well, Oxford. He says he got a degree in French. <laughs> I can't speak it, but uh, you got a degree in history at Oxford University. What led you to Silicon Valley? So I, I uh, grew up in Wales and uh, <clears throat> then went to, was lucky enough um, to, to get admission to Oxford. And this was Britain uh, in the 1970s. Uh, in the early 1970s when uh, there were gas strikes and coal strikes and all sorts of strikes and it was uh, pretty bleak and miserable and I just got a bee in my bonnet uh, about coming to live in America uh, having no idea uh, beyond books and movies and music that permeated the uh, Beaches of South Wales, uh, really didn't know anything about America. I'd been here once working uh, for a few weeks, uh, but just decided there was more opportunity here. Um, and so I, I came to America in 1976 and uh, without actually knowing anyone in America and uh, just with no plan, and <laughs> no grand plan whatsoever. And uh, one thing gradually led to another. And uh, it eventually led to Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> 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 well, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. I actually came across you for the first time in 1982 in a subway train in Paris, France. Uh, I w didn't meet you personally, but I, I, read an I was working at Apple Computer, and I read an article about Steve Jobs uh, that you wrote. Uh, that led also as part of your book, The Little Kingdom. Tell us how you got to Silicon Valley and, and got to know Mr. Jobs and, and that, that whole process. So after I came to uh, America, the only way actually that I was able to come to America was to figure out um, how to go to school here and I was lucky enough to get a scholarship and I got a scholarship and, and finished my uh, education and then again, really without a grand plan, wound up as a um, correspondent, uh, which was my first experience of working portion of life um, uh, for Time Magazine. And actually spent a reasonable amount of time in Ohio. Um, visited Cleveland and Akron and Toledo and uh, um, previously actually Columbus, because I was uh, my first uh, um, stint while working at Time was actually working in Detroit um, during uh, the end of the 1970s, uh, 1979, um, and uh, following the um, previous massive collapse of the automobile industry, and found it fascinating. Loved being in Detroit, loved learning about industry in the Midwest, um, and then was transferred by Time uh, to California and wound up uh, in San Francisco and at that point I barely could I knew California was on the leftmost part of America and after that you fell off into the water and um, in in San Francisco didn't know I didn't know about Silicon Valley I didn't know Silicon Valley existed but uh, my job was to get stories in the magazine and um, I got very interested in uh, what was happening in Silicon Valley. And this was at a time when companies like Apple that Mark just mentioned, it was a private company, Genentech was a private company, Intel was about 10 years old, but it was, uh, it was not that well known outside of um, uh, California. Microsoft was still small and private and doing maybe a couple of million dollars of revenue a year. And I started, getting interested in these companies, started writing about them, met um, some of the people running the company, some of the founders of the companies, and uh, then eventually met the people surrounding the companies, the lawyers and other uh, supporting services, including 
uh, people in the venture capital industry, and uh, which is how I wound up at Sequoia. But at Time Magazine, to answer uh, Mark's question, I, I um, started writing about Apple and became, this is a long time ago now, this is 30 years ago, and this was just after, most of you probably, or maybe here in California, a lot of people don't remember the time that Apple was, was, a foot, was relegated to being a footnote of the personal uh, computer industry. But uh, back then, um, at the time that Mark was alluding to, IBM had just entered the uh, personal computer industry and, uh, and Apple was considered to be uh, a company in considerable peril. Uh, but I had met both the Steve, Steve Wozniak, and obviously the far better known and now very, very sadly departed Steve Jobs. And was, um, I was there telling somebody uh, this last night at dinner, is the only person that I've ever met in my life that I felt to com uh, compelled to write uh, a book about. And I was very interested, not in the stuff that was known publicly in 82, 83 about Apple when it was already a public company, but in the first 48 months of the life of that company when nobody knew about it, how it had come into existence, what stimulated it, all the odd stories that inevitably surround a little company um, that is trying to become far bigger. And eventually, as, as Mark said, that um, that became a book that he had the misfortune of encountering on the subway in Paris. By the way, if you haven't had a chance, um, do read The Little Kingdom. You republished it. Is, it's in print again, right? Uh, it, it is. It's, um, it's downloadable everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a fascinating story and, uh, about what happened in the early days. And that's actually a good segue into, as you said, becoming a, a venture capitalist. Um, one of the words that you, you, you like to use a lot when you're looking at entrepreneurs, and you said it here a little bit here, is humble beginnings. Tell us about humble beginnings. It's humble beginnings. On the whole, there are obviously examples that um, are contrary to this. But humble beginnings, for us anyway, are the light motif of um, our business. Uh, Sequoia Capital itself isn't very large. We have, uh, we do a lot with a few people. But I'm struck by the fact that the people who work with uh, with Sequoia Capital um, have they, they all had humble beginnings. Uh, my closest partner uh, was uh, was born in uh, was born in Genoa, and his parents had no money. Um, they came and uh, eventually wound up. Uh, living in Brooklyn. He eventually became a salesman for mm. uh, Sun Microsystems. And it's a similar story uh, with many of the other people um, uh, who have been at Sequoia for a good long time. They're self-made. Um, they or their families had very little at the beginning. And that's invariably what we find in the people that we encounter who are starting and developing companies. They're unlikely people. Uh, they won't necessarily have been to all the right schools. They won't have had their passport stamped with uh, uh, you know, all the right career markings. In fact, many of them will have passports from foreign countries because the proportion of people that uh, we get into business with, and predominantly in California, which is the heart of our business in the United States, uh, the, majority, the vast majority of them are immigrants. And they have uh, these same hallmarks. They came here with nothing. They got incredibly interested in something. They got the bug to start a company. They were off, began a journey that seemed implausible at a young age in, that, uh, in their early 20s. And they began that um, um, journey against all odds. And for it's hard for all of us in this room, now that Apple is either the most valuable or second most valuable company in the world, to remember a time that nobody knew about the company. And it was just two people. But that's where everything <laughs> begins. It began with the companies that Mark just mentioned, Yahoo and Google and PayPal and Cisco Systems. 
it usually, it's almost always starts with two people for some weird reason. I, I can't remember many companies where we just invest in one person. It's usually two founders, if only because one founder needs an, somebody else to talk to. Uh, <laughs> but everybody, every company starts off as a complete unknown. And for us, then, it becomes this journey against all odds where nobody expects you to succeed. Uh, that, that brings me to my next question. I remember when I was at a cocktail party here talking to some, uh, some uh, investors. Uh, this is before I, uh, the governor talked me into uh, this high paying job. And um, he, uh, he, you know, I was talking to a couple gentlemen, they go, yeah, we're looking at this company, but boy, that kid, man, he's you know, 28, 29, wet behind the ears. What does he know? He doesn't know anything. Um, talk to us about how you see, I mean, I usually quote the quote that I'd say 70, 80% of the companies, the early stage companies that Sequoia funds, they're in their 20s, early e 20s. Easily. Easily. So how, what do you see in that? I mean, you know, you know, my son Alexander, he's 23, right. just got money from a venture capitalist yeah. to start his company. What, why are the youth, uh, what do you see in the youth? Well, this sounds odd, but they usually know a lot more than we do. And everybody says, <laughs> how can you say that? You're a 57-year-old has-been. Um, how can a 19 or 20-year-old know a lot more than you? Well, for me, it's pretty easy. But um, uh, if you step back and think about it, the thing they know a lot more about is what they're really seriously interested in. You know, Ma Malcolm Gladwell's written a, a lot about that and, and, and puts it very fluently and eloquently. But imagine if you're in your teens and you become fascinated with something and you have that period of time in your teens and perhaps early 20s where you don't have distractions. You, you don't have a job, you don't have a family, you don't have commitments. Um, and you can afford to indulge your passion. Your passion can be Bill Gates, circa 1973, figuring out how to uh, uh, write um, programming languages for microcomputers. It could be uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak thinking about um, how to do, build single board computers. It could be Chad Hurley or Steve Chen, the founders of YouTube, trying to figure out how to send video uh, to one another. It could be Max Levchin, this incredibly wonderful Ukrainian mathematician who was one of the co-founders of PayPal, trying to figure out how to move money between mobile phones. Well, all of these people in their particular spheres had thought a lot more, thought far more deeply about that particular topic than any of the rest of us. They may not have known a lot about other stuff. They may not have known how to read a chart of accounts or how to think about marketing or how to set up international operations or how to build a logistics center. But all of that stuff, you can hire people to do that. What you cannot hire people to do is to have the wonderful spark and founding instinct and deep fascination and abiding passion for a particular topic. And for us anyway, um, people, youthful people, are by far the best uh, guides to the future. Uh, and, and that's the reason that as Mark said, the, the vast majority of companies that we get involved with anywhere, not just in California, but elsewhere where we do business in Israel and China and in India, um, that's a hallmark of our business. So um, this young entrepreneur passionate for this idea, um, as a venture capitalist, you like to put money to work to invest <coughs> in a good play to flip it very quickly? <laughs> no, uh, no. Tell, tell us, what, 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 what is your philosophy as far as investing in these young entrepreneurs? So, uh, Mark was um, uh, picking out a whole bunch of phrases that he knows are anathema to the way that we think. Now, if you don't know much about the venture business, it's, it's perfectly understandable. For most people, the venture business is... Um, something that either they don't know much, or there's no reason that people should know anything about it. But if you were to play quick word association, people would probably uh, automatically conclude that, oh, 
Um, these guys are um, hit and run artists. They're, as Mark was saying, quick flippers. They just want to invest now and cash out in uh, 18 months or a couple of years. Um, and that's the caricature. Understandable, but for the very best venture firms, completely, um, uh, it's a complete mischaracterization. And I, you know, I sometimes say this um, a little bit tongue in cheek, but if people really understood what we do, what we did, it'd make Warren Buffett look as if he has a, a short term investment mentality. And I'll give you some examples. Um, we, Sequoia Capital, was fortunate enough to encounter the, uh, uh, the founders of Cisco in 1987. And uh, we invested in Cisco in 1987. The company went public in 1990. One of Mark and uh, my partners served as the chairman of the board of directors of uh, Cisco and, until, I think, 2000 and 2003. Uh, we uh, invested in Google when it was a, a very small company in 1999. Here we are now, almost in 2012. I still own the vast majority of the shares that I ever got in Google. It's 12, 13 years later. And um, our belief is that you, the great companies, the great companies that have grown up in Ohio, the ones of yesteryear and then, you know, the current ones like, that you all know, Cardinal and The Limited and, and, and other fabulous companies that call Ohio home. Those took decades to build. And so our holding periods when we make investments tend to be very long. And we can afford it. We, we just don't think you can, you can't, value doesn't magically assemble itself within 12 months or 18 months. And even when a company goes public, even though the companies obviously today are going public way later than they, uh, on the whole, way later than they used to uh, 15 years ago. For the really great companies, that the public, the IPO, um, is still, when you see it you know, 10 years hence, it's still very early in the development phase of the company. Cisco went public in 1990. Market cap was $300 million when that company went public. We have a, another company that, again, I have owned shares in probably now 23 years, a company called Microchip Technology. It's a semiconductor company. No reason that you should know about it, but it's a beautiful, wonderful business run by the same incredible guy who was running it in 1987. Um, it's just, he's just developed a business over 25 years. And now, you know, there's an, I don't want to paint myself completely as, you know, uh, we're not the sort of male equivalents of Joan of Arc here. There's an element of opportunism to our business. And obviously, there are very few great businesses. And some businesses over time, you know that the best thing to do is to sell them because circumstances have changed or the products are late or things have just disappointed. That happens. But for the great companies that come along, you want to hold them for decades. Um, one thing that uh, I've commented on quite a few times here is the lack of venture capital in Ohio. Uh, the Columbus Dispatch report in 2010, venture capital uh, about $150 million total in the whole state uh, last year. Mm -hmm. What role do you think uh, venture capital uh, holds for you know, jo job creation, for company creation, for doing the things that you do. Um, wh wh where, where do you put venture capital in the things that the Sequoia Partnership and, and the other folks up and down Sand Hill Road do? What, what value do they create? So Sand Hill Road is, is a road in near Stanford University where there are a whole bunch of uh, different venture capital firms. Um, it, it's hard to answer Mark's question without appearing boastful. And uh, I am very happy all the time if a company is successful, the founder, the entrepreneur, um, deserves 110% of the credit. Uh, but for me, the test is whether, for whether or not Sequoia Capital ever contributed anything, is to go back to the founder, pretty much, and uh, sort of rhetorically pose the question, well, what have you, we been able to do for you? And when we invest in a company, we, we invariably will tell the founder, 
what we want, partly because it makes our whole pursuit in life worthwhile, partly because it's good for business, what we would like from you 10 years from now is to say that one of the very best business decisions you made in the evolution of your company was to choose Sequoia Capital as your business partner. Which means that we've done a whole bunch of things for him or her along the way. And they invariably revolve around um, just a few things. If you're a little company starting off, it is very, very hard for you to get customers. You have no credibility. Who would ever think of buying a, com a computer from a company with a joke little name from Apple. When we invested in Cisco, the products were about to get thrown out of their early customer, Hewlett Packard, because they were unreliable. One thing that we can do is help get a little company customers. We can't get the purchase orders, but we can always get in to see the people who uh, make the decisions to, uh, to purchase products, which little companies by themselves uh, usually have a very tough time doing. Second thing that everybody needs are people. When you have a little company and you're trying to recruit people, maybe it's the first few engineers. They're all, they're like the customers. They're very skittish. They've never heard of this company. They don't know if it's going to be around. They, they don't know who the founder, there's no credibility. I cannot begin to tell you how often we are involved helping to close the first three, four, five, six engineers I'm involved with a little payments company in California right now. I've taught, we have 14 people. I've talked to 12 of them as we've recruited them into the company to help close them and get them uh, into the company. Not because I'm going to be the engineering manager or anything like that, or can even write a line of code, but it gives them some faith and confidence that the, um, the company's going to be around. And then you need to do business elsewhere with other larger companies. Well, again, we've been around a lot, know most of these people. Easy for us to get into. In, in to see them. You need to do business overseas. Well, in a whole bunch of countries, we're fairly well established and, and set up. You need to raise money in the future. We can do that. But as you can tell from that, the actual check, the money, the wire transfer, is the least important ingredient in, in everything we do. We have our own dedicated human capital uh, function and keep track on a daily and weekly basis about how many referrals of engineers, executives, et cetera, that we're making uh, to companies a year, how we're helping them recruit. There's a marketing function. There's a, uh, a money-raising function for companies as well. So it, it, it's um, not just wiring a check and then sitting back and waiting five years and hoping something larger comes uh, by return mail. What um, <clears throat> we were talking when we were uh, at the State House talking about innovative companies and how do you stay innovative? And I was actually up at uh, at the Temkin companies, uh, which you may know. Yeah. His great grandfather created ball bearings many, yeah. many moons ago, and they're having their biggest year ever because they've innovated in the last ten years in a lot of different areas. Um, been around for a long time. We have companies like Procter and Gamble. How how do you look at innovation? How do how I mean, in some ways, in the last 30 years, a lot of innovation passed many companies here in Ohio. How do you look at what's happening in Silicon Valley, and how can you bring that, that sort of innovative culture to the Midwest or to wherever it, hap it may, may be? Well, I, I don't necessarily know how to import. I, all I can do in answer to that question explain, is explain how we think about it. And I'll, I'll start with Sequoia Capital um, itself, because uh, I worry about this all the time. because. We, even though Sequoia started in a small way in 1973. So um, by Silicon Valley standards, we've, not by Ohio standards, but by Silicon Valley standards, we've been around a, uh, a long time. And then I look at all these companies that have been um, important parts of the technology world or of Silicon Valley over the last 30 years, and they might have names like Sun Microsystems or Digital Equipment or Tandem or Compaq or Lotus <coughs> Development or... Um, Cray Computer, or a raft of names like that, who once were high flyers, they once were darlings, they once were seen as innovative, and then they fell by the wayside. Wang Labs, you know, the, the, the landscape is littered with the carcasses of yesterday's high flying company. And I always think to myself, oh my goodness gracious, here we are. I never want that to happen to Sequoia Capital. So, um, yeah, obviously, 
um, one thing that these companies did was not worry about competitors, not worry about changes in the marketplace, get too complacent, um, not work hard enough, not be hungry enough, all of those sorts of things that's very easy to say. They all sound like very convenient sound bites you can extract from one of these how-to business books, but they're very, very, very difficult uh, to implement in practice. And for our own business, I often think, gosh, if, if people are going to be more imaginative or more creative and demonstrate more wit, we've got to be ahead of them in being able to do that. And I think this exact same thing happens for companies. And I also think it begins with the product and making the product really relevant for people. People have a successful company and they lose touch with the product and making it, uh, making it very, very important uh, for the company. Just go back and, you know, there's all this stuff that's been written about Apple and Steve Jobs um, in, in the last few months um, is, is well worth reflecting on because this was a man who took over a company that was essentially bankrupt in 1997. And he realized that the products that this company was selling were embarrassing. They weren't doing anything for the customer. They weren't distinctive. They weren't special. They had nothing that captivated the interest of the, of the customer. And for me, at Sequoia Capital, it starts with, uh, we, we're a service firm, not a product firm. It starts with the service that we're providing. Is it still relevant at, for, our, uh, 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 for our customers who are large, you know, entrepreneurs largely? For a products company, I think um, people, they, they just lose touch, with, uh, lose touch with the product. But I think as Steve Jobs showed at Apple, absolutely anything. Absol it doesn't matter whether it's, for me, the, and uh, you, can, you can look at two things, uh, which I spent a fair amount of time thinking about both of these. One is Apple and the second is Singapore which to me show that anything is possible for a company or for a state. Apple, because it was out of money and bankrupt in 1997 in the technology business. And the technology business is, believe me, because of the ferocity of compet uh, competition, the single toughest place to turn around a company. And the second is Singapore, population several million people, that was a malarial swamp in 1965, a malarial swamp in 1965. But people in both places decided we need to have a purpose, we need to be doing something that we really believe in. We need, in Singapore's case, to be contributing something of great value to our local community and have something that others yearn for. And I think the same was true for Apple, and those that lose sight of it are the ones that forget to innovate. Okay, uh, we're gonna have questions here in just a minute, <coughs> but uh, one of your, uh, uh, my favorite sayings that you have is get real. Uh, and I'd like you to get real right now with the United States of America. And I'd like, you travel the world, you go to China, you go to India, you go to Israel, you go to all, all over the place. As you see what we're doing, if what worries you, and as well as where the opportunities are. How would you get real for the United States? So get real is this little two-word phrase that whenever anybody is pumping, as some, actually a partner of ours who comes from Ohio has this lovely phrase, whenever we have people pumping sunshine, mm -hmm. we always tell them to get real. Uh, we have a lot of sunshine pumpers in our business. Um, I always feel very bad about saying anything negative about the United States. Uh, because I came here, as I mentioned earlier, as an immigrant, I owe everything that I have in life to everything that's wonderful about America. Um, I'm an American citizen. Um, I think of myself as being pretty actively engaged these days in sort of civic discourses and things. Um, and so I always feel jittery about when it, when it comes to being 
plain spoken and, and direct because there are so many wonderful things um, that uh, uh, are evident here. But if you really want to understand America, Menlo Park, California and Columbus, Ohio is not the place from which to view America. You want to go to Mumbai, you want to go to Saigon, you want to go to Shanghai and Beijing and there, from there, you get a very dis uh, different perspective about America and you know I grew up in a country that I left because it had become slow moving um, resting on its laurels its best days were behind it and um, the era of uh, affluence had begun uh, to corrode uh, absolutely everything and I think the big challenge for America which is a wonderful challenge to have, and America would be the first country in the history of the world to be able to do this, is to reverse, is to do what the Romans were unable to do, the Spaniards were unable to do, the Portuguese were unable to do, the British were unable to do, which is to reverse the decline of empire. And that's our challenge today. Is it achievable? That's why I, I, I think of the story of Apple and the story of Singapore. I realize it's far more complicated in a country like America with its 350 million population and all the states and everything else. But I, I just have to believe that with the right leadership, it is possible to reverse the declines that we're all painfully aware of. Uh, and that we see everywhere, whether it's in the schools or in the fabric of the infrastructure or the fact that the communication systems uh, really are fairly third world compared to what you can get in, in, in China these days or even in parts of, um, of developed Africa or more developing Africa. And all the other litany of things with which were, uh, you know, the, the issues about entitlements and and indebtedness and spending habits. I think it's all reversible, but it requires fantastic leadership and tremendous determination and will. Uh, and if we get both those, a combination of those two things, then the future is bright. Without them, we're on an irretrievable downward glide, and the only question is how steep the angle is. Well, with that, <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I, I know with Mike, he's always direct. Um, well, let, let's just, I'll have one more, one more thing and then we'll take questions. And this is uh, a follow on from that maybe. You have this phrase and, and you talked about it a little bit, but we're only as good as our next investment. Well, uh, I happen to think that's true. I have an office that I keep fairly spartan in California. Um, no, okay, sorry. Shh. This is Mike Morris's office. Okay, first of all, there is no door, there is no wall, there is no cubicle. Okay, he sits in the middle with nothing around, I mean, everyone's around him. You go to his desk, there is no file cabinet. Okay, there is a pen on the desk should he be in the office. That's how you know if he's in the office or not. There's a pen, on, there's a computer, uh, an iMac computer, there's a, de a chair behind that desk and there's a side desk with two chairs. There's no artwork, there's no nothing. Well, so my only point was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you all want to move in. People come by, we have a, a lawyer who's got a wry sense of humor and he came by after I'd done all this. He said, I love what you've done to the place. <laughs> but I don't, what I was gonna say was, I don't have any of these ornaments and plaques that commemorate investments or companies from yesteryear. I just think they're irrelevant. And it's about the past and it's about, it. I was at Hewlett Packard the other day walking around and they've got a museum, uh, which is very touching. It's really interesting. They've got all these old oscilloscopes and computers and, and, and you know, these wonderful calculators from 1971. Fascinating. They should not be in the company if you're thinking about tomorrow and they should be in a museum someplace off campus or off, off the premises. And that's the way that I think about our own business. I think, and it's what I was alluding to earlier, I think 
if we don't stay ahead of everybody else, uh, gradually, it's the story of every company that began to go down. Unless you keep that fire up and keep worrying about losing tomorrow, uh, you'll never reap um, all the wonders and benefits that, uh, that come from tomorrow, which is why we try to, obviously you want to learn from the past and not repeat the mistakes from the past, but you never, from my point of view, uh, want to roll in relish in uh, past triumphs. So with that, <coughs> uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, please uh, come up to the mic here. Uh, keep them short and sweet as we are on television as well. Sir. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Jim Rutledge from the law firm of Bricker and Eckler. Welcome to Columbus. Michael, we were chatting beforehand and you said your 23-year-old your old son was your greatest critic. What have you learned from your son? What, what, what lessons has he taught you? Oh, I, I, uh, he uh, has helped me um, communicate and I think also, um, Every individual is like this. You never think of the effect that you as an individual have on another person. Thank you. Next question. Boy, people are in Columbus are that shy? <laughs> Come on, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna call Doug Price to ask a question. If it, uh, yeah. Can I ask you uh, Alex, Alex, why don't you ask a question? I'll do it from here. So we as a community have 125,000 college students moving around what does that say to you about our opportunity in entrepreneurialism or investing in 20 something year olds in terms of our technology? So let me just repeat the question. Uh, oops, that's if I keep my microphone on. Uh, let me repeat the question. The question was, uh, we have 125,000 college students coming into OSU, and by the way, you've got to visit that university. Yeah. Uh, an amazing place. Uh, how, do you, how do you think that can influence this, uh, the, the area of Columbus and the Columbus metropolitan and, area? And, and job creation. Well. Yeah. Um, I don't know the composition of the student body. Um, if it is composed of deadbeats like the two of us, French majors and history majors, uh, it would lead you to one conclusion. Uh, if it is composed of mathematicians and physicists and chemists and biologists and natural scientists, it would lead you to a, a far rosier set of um, projections about what might be possible. So I think with scientists uh, in particular, um, the, the future should be quite bright, provided that they have the wherewithal in, um, to be able, and it doesn't have to be a lot of money, but just the spirit and surrounds to be able to imagine that they can start a company here in Ohio and anything is possible, and that they don't have to go to California in order to be able to do that. Next question. Yes, I'm Jane Scott. Thank you for being yeah, here. It's great to have you. I'm curious about the Midwest seems to be risk adverse and also it seems to me, not having children, so I'll qualify that, that we are teaching our children that there is no such thing as failure. I mean, everybody gets a plaque, everybody gets a passing grade, everybody, you know, um, comments on risk <clears throat> and how we teach that it's okay to fail and that risk is a good thing. Uh, yeah, risk, failure, rejection, uh, it's been the story of my life, <laughs> particularly the failure and rejection. <laughs> and uh, I think that's, uh, it, it's, you know, I don't know if you listen to Lake Wobegon and Garrison Keeler in the town where every child is above average. <laughs> um, uh, but clearly that's not, not the case. And instilling in people the fact that, gosh, you have to really fight for something that's worthwhile, or you're gonna get buffeted and pounded and rejected, and you're gonna fail along the way, but that's okay, dust yourself off and get back up and fight. That's life, and in particular, that's all about uh, building a business. I think, you know, Mark, Mark has started um, several businesses I've been involved with with lots of businesses over time. I mean, looking at my email stream from this morning, and we're you know involved in a whole variety of different things. I'm looking at my emails. Most of them contain bad news about something or other. <laughs> um, but reacting to them and not allowing them to get you down, and not 
worrying too much about failing at something. Uh, certainly, um, that's, um, that's the fuel that is in the tanks of uh, most of the founders, and all of the founders and entrepreneurs that we're in business with. Next question. Hi, David Chesbrough. I'm the CEO at COSI, the Center of Science and Industry. Michael, think of Exploratorium or the tech or the others yes, uh, yeah. out your way. Um, I'm going to triangulate. You, you, you talked about the America. You mentioned about um, Ohio State and scientists. Do you folks who invest in companies ever think about or look at or worry about science education? I mean, our domain is obviously the public understanding of science and innovation, uh, encouraging. A lot, of, a lot of studies suggest that interest is a higher predictor than achievement in earlier grades into where the people go in life. So I'm just wondering what your perspective on that, if at all. Oh, we think about it a tremendous amount. You know, in Singapore, they go and recruit from mainland China the brightest 15-year-old mm. mathematicians and scientists that they can get from the high schools, and they bring them to Singapore, and then they encourage them to stay in Singapore after they've graduated from high school and go to the university. It's the lifeblood of our society. These are the navigators of our future. Without them, we don't have a prosperous future. Th these are the adventurers and navigators of tomorrow. And so when in California in particular, which all of you know has got profound problems, when we look at the fact that a student now entering UC Berkeley, one of the finest undergraduate institutions in the country, maybe in the world, is now having to pay $16,000 a year to go there? And these are talented people. And many of them are no longer going to be able to afford to go there. Or look at the condition of the high schools throughout the country and the level of science education is not so, you know the real problem is in the high schools not the that because that's where things get made or, or broken I think it's pro if you had to list if you were a CEO trying to fix America the number one thing you do is focus on science education in high schools hi let's say there's a local tech entrepreneur we'll call him Adam Goldberg <laughs> and he wants to get in front of a Sequoia Capital. How does that happen first? And secondly, how do you go about valuing companies like a Google raised $25 million with no way to monetize that search engine? How does that happen? How do they get such valuation? And how do you go about valuing companies today? So uh, the first, the answer to the first question, really simple. Don't stand on protocol, just shoot us an email. We get lots of emails a day, we answer every one of them, we try and get back to everybody within 24 hours. It's real simple, there aren't filters, just email. You can go to our website, all of our email addresses are on the website, just shoot us an email. And I guarantee we'll get back to you, and we'll get back to you in short order. On valuations, um, it's subjective. I always sort of, I know, you know, my, my eyes glaze over when I look at spreadsheets, in part because I can't do even the simplest things on spreadsheets. Um, I just think of what we're trying to do is to come up with a sense roughly of what we feel is, quote, a fair value. And by a fair value, it's not very complicated. If you've started a company, we're, go we're going to be thinking of three buckets. We're going to be thinking of you, the founder or the founding group, we're going to be thinking of all the people that we need to hire into the company, and we're going to be thinking of Sequoia. And we're trying to achieve a balance so that we all feel like real owners in the business. We wouldn't want to come in and say, gosh, you as the founder of the company, you now have a small share. You're not going to feel incented. You're going to feel badly treated. It's got to feel right for you that you're getting something uh, reasonable and, uh, and fair. And that's going to vary depending on the company. If you have just, it's two or three people and it's the idea for a product and there's no product there yet, that's very different from if you've got a company that's doing 15 or 20 million dollars a year in revenue. And uh, at Yahoo and at Cisco, both of them examples of companies where there was pretty much nothing when we invested. It was just a third, a third, a third. Third for the founders, third we're going to set aside for all the people that we're going to bring into the company over the next five years. And then a third uh, for Sequoia. Real simple. And the most important thing, it felt fair to the founders. Next question. 
Steve Becker. Um, reading Berkshire Hathaway's annual report several years ago when they were looking for major acquisitions to make, after he went through the technical criteria, he said he'd promise you two things. One was complete confidentiality. The second was an extremely fast turnaround. He said, we can usually tell you in five minutes if we're interested. Mm -hmm. What are some of the characteristics and how long does it take to you to get a real sense of do you have an interest in the company? It, it, it varies a little bit. In, in part because sometimes what we're trying to figure out is whether there's an underlying technology that really works. That's a lot different from looking at, and I'm not demeaning, uh, uh, demeaning this at all, but you know, if you're looking at a beverage company or logistics company that's got 30 or 40 years of operating history, that's different as opposed to looking at a startup. And these startups usually emerge surrounded by lots of other startups, all of whom are trying to do something somewhat similar. Um, so um, we can tell very quickly if we have zero interest. We can tell that within th you know, 10 minutes or reading the email straight away. Then let's assume we have some interest, but we don't know how deep our interest is going to be. That's going to take us a bit more time. And if we're then, think about it this way, if it, particularly in the venture business, we want to be very careful and purposeful about where we elect, not to invest the money so much, but where we're going to invest our time. Because as I was saying earlier, this can be fi a five-year, eight-year, ten-year commitment. So we want to do as much as possible to get it right. So usually there, let's assume that first email piques our interest. From there to when we actually make a decision will probably take us 30 days. Okay, last question, thank you. Roger Blackwell. As a person who observes Steve Jobs with more depth than most and certainly more length than most, what would you say would be traits of his that other entrepreneurs could or should emulate and which traits should they avoid? Uh, it's a wonderful question which probably is the topic of a book in and of itself. Um, and obviously much has been written about Steve's difficult uh, and mercurial personality. Um, but on the whole, I think people who do unusual things, they're not saints. And whether it's true, you know, that was true obviously about Steve, but it's true about a whole load of other business leaders that all of us could uh, identify with as well. As, and, and leaders in any role, it's a difficult thing to lead an organization as a saint every single day. Um, but there are many lessons of, um, of, of things that, uh, you know, the, Steve had, I think he had zero distractions in his life. It was just Apple and his family and he kept everything else to one side. He wasn't distracted by all the other sorts of things that distract people. He understood that doing a few things, just a limited number of things better than anybody else was much better than doing a lot of things about the same as everybody else. He understood that customers are usually wrong. If you ask customers about what they want, they're usually, uh, they usually um, uh, won't, uh, won't get it right. Um, and there are many more such examples, uh, you know, I think the probably 10 or 15 of those sorts of lessons that you can take away from Steve that would be as good a guide to what you need if you're thinking about starting a company as, as any 500 page manual. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I feel like a great tutorial. A great for uh, a history and a French major. I want to encourage you to continue the conversation uh, as we leave today out in the lobby. We've got coffee and cookies and that kind of thing. Sign up for tomorrow's program. It's a little bit different approach to things. Um, and you'll meet uh, this great artist, Brian Toll. The, the program Thursday at the museum called Jingle Mingle. A lot of good stuff in the auction. Um, and uh, most of all, I want to Thank our, our partner today, and that's Columbus Tech, and our sponsors, the Columbus Partnership, Columbus 2020, and Resource Interactive, all of these people up here. Um, and a very special thanks to Mark Kwame and Michael Mortz.
terrific program. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon.